All right, everyone, welcome to Abusing C++17. Um, so before I actually get started, I'm going to try something I've never done before. I've got like a pile of swag here with like t-shirts and stuff. So if you like give a good answer and you want a t-shirt, say if you want medium, large, or extra large, and I'll wing one at you. Does that sound good? They're, <laughs> they're the uh, CBP cast official t-shirt. So. So about me, um, I'm Jason Turner, co-host of CppCast. Has everyone heard of CppCast? Yes. yes. Everyone has? Most what? Yes. Most people have. Yeah, that's, oh. <laughs> what size do you want? <laughs> Medium, large, or extra large? Oh, large. Large, OK. Hey, all right. Uh, I'm also host of C++ Weekly, which is a YouTube series, and that's fun. Every week I publish a new video about C++. But this is uh, maybe the more important thing that I want to just share before I move on talking about me is I am branching out into training. So if anyone is looking for on-site training or off-site training or whatever, my next training event that I have scheduled is July 12th through the 14th in Chicago. And there's the URL for it. And if you're watching this video later on YouTube, that's July 12th through the 14th, 2017. It might already be passed. So C++ 17 has a lot of little details. There's a lot to cover. We are by far not going to do an, an exhaustive survey of what C++ 17 adds. We're going to highlight things. We're going to move fast. Please interrupt me. Please ask questions. Makes it more fun for everyone. Uh, we're going to leave things out, definitely. And we're having fun. So some of this is abuse. Some of this is practical. We're going to try to bring it around to practical. So fold expressions. This is added in C++17. It's four different types of fold expressions. We have a unary left, unary right, binary left, and binary right. And these are all the different operators that you're allowed to use fold expressions. That's just high level. This is the detail. Unary left fold is the dot, dot, dot. That dot, dot, dot is literal dot, dot, dot. That's not just a placeholder. That's the expansion. And then whatever operator you want, and the args, and it's a left, and it gets expanded like this. Does that make sense? All right. Similarly, the right. And for some reason, my brain always wants to think of left and right backward personally. Like, I feel like the args should be what's on the, the side that it is. Like, I feel personally feel like this should be what's called left, but that's because this is my brain, I guess. So that's a unary right fold, and you can see the parens, the grouping, goes that way now. Binary left, same thing, but you're giving an initial value, and the grouping's on the left. And binary right, grouping's on the right, again, with an initial value. So, has everyone seen the for each argument? It was, like, I remember Sean Parent, Eric Niebler talking about it shortly after 2011. The idea was that you could say you have your lambda here, and on line 12, should probably be referring to the line numbers since I made a point of putting them on the slides, and on line 13 is the, the things that you want to call. So you're basically saying I want to call C out on the values 1, 2, 3, and 4 separately, and for each argument kind of makes an abuse of the initializer list from C++ 11 to do a emulation, if you will, of the fold expressions that we've got in C++17. So we can modernize this for C++17, and we don't have to use the initializer list to abuse it. This is just a straightforward uh, um, expression, fold expression. We were doing a right fold, so it's just, it's doing the forward of TS with argument A and with a comma operator. So that's that the comma is our operator between these uh, fold expansions. And notice that I have this void here. Who knows why I have a void here? Because otherwise you can overload the comma operator. Because overload you can, you can, otherwise the comma operator could be overloaded and then subvert what we're trying to accomplish. Do you want a t-shirt? That's, sorry if I, 
Oh, not quite. All right. Is there any way that you think we could keep the results of these function calls if they return values? Yes, so done. You could initialize an array out of them, but you don't know what the types are going to be. Initialize the list, initialize the array are all going to require the same result type. So we could throw it into a tuple, but anyone, anyone? What's that? Sorry. That's true. We're not actually doing a C++ 17 fold expression anymore. We're just doing a variadic expansion from the C++ 11 sense. It's a good point. But we are um, taking advantage of tuple, which was also had in C++ 11. So this, this is not C++ 17 at all, I guess. But <laughs> we, uh, first of all, we're skipping ahead to template type deduction. Oops, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, too bad we don't have regular void yet. If any of these functions <laughs> were to return void, there you go, there's Matt. Um, we need regular void so we can do things like this. This is an obvious use case. If any one of these function calls were to return void, then this would fail to compile. Yes, Matt. This also would have a failure currently because if any of your functions return, uh, if you have one function that returns void, this will not do what you want. If I had one function that returned a tuple, it would not do what a... Oh. Right. So, okay. So the comment was, if there's exactly one function in the expansion that returns a tuple itself, then we would be invoking uh, effectively a move into this tuple that we want to return, and it would get flattened instead of being a tuple of a tuple, it would just be a tuple. So, what was that? The beauty of template argument deduction. Yes, the beauty of template argument deduction. So then uh, I expanded this into this for each element um, idea. So on, on line eight, that's our function for each element, and we are taking a tuple, and a callable, and we're passing that up to our for each element impl. And in there, we are using, uh, a, taking advantage of the index sequence to get all of the indices of the uh, tuple elements and invoking our callable on each one of them. It's perfectly clear, right? I'll, I'll get, walk through it a little bit. Basically, we're just expanding this into a call into our callable for each element of the tuple. What's more interesting is I heard this one, is Vittorio here? I don't think so. I heard this one came from Vittorio. This is a much more condensed uh, version of this. Does exactly the same thing. It's perfectly obvious what we're doing, right? Anyone want to walk through it? No, I'll, I'll walk through it. Uh, I, I saw this and I, I, I had to throw it into Compiler Explorer, prove to myself that it worked, and then I had to figure out what it was doing. So this is now we're, we're really kind of abusing C++ 17 here. For the record, standard apply is C++ 17, right? So we take our for each element call, and I'm just going to replace the for each elem uh, function declaration. So we've got our function, which is our C out, and we've got our tuple, which is our tuple values, one, two, three, four, again. And then I'm swapping, just you know, kind of manually inlining this. So the actual call to tuple that's on line eight, it's getting swapped out with this version. So now we're taking standard apply, we're passing it a lambda and a tuple. So what does standard apply do? I mean, I know the answer, but does anyone else know the answer? Michael does. Yes, it, so it takes it takes a function, it calls a function by unpacking all of the elements of the tuple into the function argument calls. So now we're at this apply line, and this effectively becomes calling our lambda, which is a variadic 
generic lambda and passing it the parameters 1, 2, 3, 4. And now we get our expansion again of calling the function with our individual values. Fun? Anyone having fun yet? So I think that's awesome, but I also think it is terrifying levels of template expansions and instantiations if you're concerned about compile time and you're using this kind of thing all over the place. Uh, they said there's a concern in the order of evaluation of the functions. Does, does the comma operator sequence them? Yes, the comma operator does sequence them. It is comma operator is a sequence, well, sequence point, but the terminology changed in C17, right? It's technically no longer sequence point, no? These are not sequence. Yes, they are. They're not being passed. <laughs> They're not being passed to a function. It's the comma operator, and the comma operator is a sequence point. Okay, they are sequenced, and it's not called a sequence point. Chandler agreed with me eventually, though. <clears throat> it works for the same reason, kind of, that the initializer list trick works. <clears throat> oh, I just realized I was pressing on the microphone. I think it's probably okay still. Okay, so what else is a tuple besides a tuple? And what size t-shirt do you want? A pair. You already have a t-shirt. All right, what else is a tuple? Homogeneous type container. Homogeneous type container. Such as? I mean, what, I, like, is there, do you have any specific examples? Okay, any sequence of types that you like. Okay, uh, I'm going for something kind of specific from the standard library. Uh, standard array. Standard array. What size t-shirt do you want? L. L? There you go. Oh, close. So we have pair, we have array. So we could call our for each element that we just created on an array. Why would we want to do that besides abuse? So as you may or may not know, I do some playing around with using C++ modern features to generate code for small platforms. Our for each, uh, it is a loop. It may or not be unrolled. That is up to the compiler to decide. Our for each elem is effectively forcing an unrolling of all of the array elements into the function calls. <laughs> I'm getting looks from the back of the room. <laughs> so depending on your application, it is possible that the for each elem version on an array could force unrolling that could increase your inlining and constant folding and <laughs> uh, for each on the other hand gives the compiler the uh, choice to uh, decide what it wants to do. <laughs> it's called abusing C++ 17 for a reason. <laughs> also, did you notice by the way and that list of operators that we can fold on, that dot star and arrow star is there. You guys know what these operators do? Most people seem to maybe. This is, you're taking a function pointer, or a method pointer that is, and, and you're calling it. So I thought, maybe I can make something that's kind of like a, a pseudo compiled script where I can say I want to make a chain and it's an object and I want to call a sequence of member functions and have them chained together somehow. So I, I came up with this, and it seemed like an idea. <clears throat> and so if I pass it one member function, our do thing member, it parses to s dot star do thing and then call, and that works. So we are just calling the method do thing. So what happens when we add a second? method. Now it parses to this. We are calling the do thing, but do thing doesn't, we don't have any way of actually saying we want to invoke that first method. And then we're trying to chain it. So this, this doesn't work. This fails to compile. Well, uh, I couldn't find any way to invoke call, 
to each member function, but it is possible to chain our data members. So I actually, this, this compiles and it works, and as I say, it works in the same way that C works without any kind of memory management or pointer checks or anything, it's virtually, but, but we can do this, but I don't know why. Yes? Could you vary the types of S? Yeah, yes, yeah. You should have been able to vary the types. Yeah, I didn't play with that. But if our LHS returned something like a T, and then our next argument was a reference to a T element, yeah, should have worked, yes. So that, that's all I really got there. Does anyone actually have any, has anyone played with this? Does anyone have any real use for it? Maybe, oh, maybe. <laughs> I heard another maybe earlier in the week, but it didn't pan out from someone else I was talking to these slides about, but no one seems to, everyone agree with me, like there's, you have just no idea why it's here, except for Ben? This reminds me of Haskell's lenses. Haskell's lenses? Sure, yeah. Like lens? That's what it I mean, that's what, they're, that's what you said, okay. Hmm. So I, I, I'm using some of the code. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So, so on that previous chain, if, if each of the member functions returned this, then it, then it would work? No, because you can't invoke them. There is no way that I could figure out how to do an invoke on the intermediary thing. I just, I couldn't figure it out. I spent a, like two days playing with this. I'm still not sure why. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have a use case. I use something similar uh, for a uh, generic logging syncs that customers may have that. Generic logging syncs. So they, they, they can call whatever function on a sync handle. But how do you chain them together? I mean, or how do you, how do you pass multiple in and take advantage? I mean, are you doing it with, the, with this fold expression kind of thing? Yeah. Okay. Well, then we'll have to talk more perhaps after right. this. Is that good enough for a t-shirt? Oh, yeah, sure. What size do you want? <laughs> uh, large. Large? All right, that's my last large. I've got extra large and medium left. One of the things I found with fold expressions is that it's really easy to instantiate thousands of templates. And I find this actually really helpful. So I was using this construct. So I'm using our make index sequence again, which is the C11 thing, to initialize 8,000 indices. And I'm passing that into the test templates. And then I'm using just a compiler switch here to determine if I want to instantiate is no throw constructible underscore V versus is no throw constructible with the braces. So everyone, does anyone have a question about the difference between these two? So the, well, I'll just go ahead and explain. On line eight, A, the underscore V is a uh, variable template that was added in, I said that right, variable template, in C++ 17 to basically, it is the equivalent of calling is no throw constructible colon colon value. And the line 10 is uh, creating an instantiation of the, uh, the integer object of is no throw constructible, and then it is implicitly converting that to bool. So the question I had was, which one of these makes more sense from a compile time perspective? Yes, Odin. Hey. Oh, eh. Odin is taking his guess. Let's say everyone who thinks that A is going to be better compile time, raise their hands. I've got like two and a half hands. Oh, four, five. All right, who thinks B is going to be better compile time? I have a lot of abstainers. That's like 10. I think there's more people than that here. <clears throat> so A took 9.6 seconds to compile, used 824 megs of RAM, and B took 19 seconds to compile and used 1.4 gigs of RAM. It, it comes down to the fact that it's having to instantiate the constructor and the conversion on the is no throw constructible, and on A, it's, it's just calling colon colon value, which is a static const. 
So then I took this the next step, and we have our canoe conjunction underscore V. Uh, yeah. <laughs> for, for the people watching this later, a wasp just flew past the screen. <clears throat> so we have conjunction V, and the, the, the point of conjunction in C17 is that you can throw in a bunch of these traits and have it tell you if they're all equal to true or not. And, um, and otherwise, we're doing a, a fold expression C17 style. So do, does anyone want to take a guess as to which one of these compiles better? B, B, B. Everyone's saying B. Um, a didn't compile <laughs> because we exceeded the maximum template depth of 1,000 for our GCC nightly build that we were using. And B took uh, 10 seconds to compile. So How long did it take for it to issue the error? I corrected for the template depth. <laughs> and this is the difference we got. 20 seconds with 1.8 gigs of RAM versus 10 seconds with 327 megs of RAM. Does anyone know why they're using a recursive template for conjunction B instead of a C++, even a C++ 11 style fold using initializer list would work? That's too many hands in that corner of the room. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. What's that? No, it's a short circuit. Yes, it's a short circuit, right. So uh, conjunction and disjunction, those are guaranteed to short circuit. So if it reaches something that is false, then it won't continue to try to instantiate the following templates because it's possible that one of them would be one that would even fail to compile. So it gives you like a compiling short circuiting mechanism. Feature. Feature. Oh, sorry. Yes. What size? <laughs> Extra large or medium is what I got left. <laughs> T-shirt on the head. <clears throat> All right. So destructuring. C17 adds structured bindings. So we can take some expression and automatically spit out the values. It's amazing. Like this. So we can on line two destructure um, our tuple T with zero and zero. Um, so what value is returned from main? Just yell out an answer. Five. Everyone agrees five. So it also works for user-defined types and arrays. And it works for other types of initialization. This is a lambda to me, but it's not a lambda. So just be clear, I, I find it perfectly unreadable. Um, <laughs> so I took this and used it to uh, see if I could destructure standard containers, because that seemed like fun. So I have this function uh, on lines 9 and 15, um, two different overloads. One of them takes a start position and a count, and the other one takes just the count. And then I pass that up to my destructure impl, again, using taking advantage of index sequence. And I am using a chain of next, begin, and forward to make sure that I am always getting out perfectly each element from the structured thing, and it will work with any type of, um, any type of uh, iterator. Um, this is not terribly important to the talk, but if anyone has questions, I just think this was fun. OK. So we can do something like this. But because I'm using forward as tuple on line 4, it's actually capturing references back. So A and B, even though they're not, even though it's not auto ref, they are references. So what is returned from line seven? <laughs> Don't do this in real code. <laughs> I, so I believe the answer is 16. Yes, it's 16. All right, so C17 adds if and its also. Has everyone seen these yet? If and its are awesome. You can just basically give it some initialization thing that you want it to do. 
followed by a semicolon, and then the test case that you want it to perform. Also works with switches, but I haven't really played with it in switches. And I think the combination of structured bindings, if switches probably change the way we interact with libraries, maybe the way we design libraries also. So just moving quickly with it, C++ is definitely lacking a using block. So we could implement one like this. Getting some laughs from the corner. We're just creating a variable in our, in our init expression and then testing that variable, testing the pointer to that variable, which we know is guaranteed to not be null. We just created it on the stack so that I'll always evaluate as true, and we can use it. Maybe, maybe something like this actually might make sense in the case that we want to uh, create a scope without like, I personally find just scopes, just scopes for the sake of a scope where you have your opening brace and then the stuff that you want to do and then the closing one, sometimes hard to read. You're like, wait, does that brace pair up with an if? Like, did someone accidentally put in a carriage return here or something? But, well, I don't know. Maybe that's an idea. But more real world examples. OF stream, test it for good. Optional, that's, I think, a gimme. And I love the last one because I hate the fact that you have to create the results object to pass into your regex match first, but this gives you a way to do it all in one line and keep the scope nice and clean. What's that? Yeah, I actually almost put in another slide with a pound define of if with, yeah, for using and then just make it look like a using, but yeah, I didn't do that. So then we have a class template type deduction. It's also added in C17. So we're going to take a little journey through history here. Well, this is kind of what it looked. Let's just say we're, we're making a pair type. This is like std pair. And we have our first and our second, and we move them in in the constructor, and then we do something like this. We have to call our pair int double. This is reasonable for everyone. So we thought that that was a bit of a pain, so we had our neat little make pair helper that used function template type deduction. And this is C11 ish. This would have looked different when make pair, I mean, a long time ago. We're using decay t and we're forwarding it into our pair, and now we can do our auto make pair one, come on, 2.3. But C17 adds class template type deductions. Now we can do this. We don't have to specify the type anymore. We don't need our helper. It's like magic. Which leads to code like this. This will be a t shirt question. What is P equal to when this program is done executing? Uh, 2.3.4? Yes, it's equal to 2.3.4. Yes. You've been trying to get one for a while now, haven't you, Odin? Sorry. Let's see if I can. Uh... So the, the problem is our on line 12. Our p was deduced as being an int comma float, or int comma double. And on line 13, p2 was a double comma double, and then we assigned and we truncated the, the double of p2 to a two. Ah, oh, hit the raptor. This, I think, is still as open to question about how much type template deduction will lead to readability or less readable C++ 17. But automatic type deduction only works if the constructor parameters match the class template parameters. So if for some reason we wanted our pair to take um, forwarding references of our types and we wanted to perfectly forward them in, this no longer works. This is now ambiguous. The compiler doesn't know what to do with this because it cannot match up the types from the constructor to the struct. Make sense? Half nods. Uh, I'm, I see people that look like they're thinking, so I just thought I'd wait a second. It makes sense, mostly. Because it can't match it up because you're invoking the constructor on line four, 
and the template parameters for the constructor are in no way related to the template constructors for the struct itself. So the compiler doesn't know what you want the struct to be. And it's reasonable. It could be that you want it to capture the reference, or you want it to, well, or you want it to decay it to a value. Uh, either one is reasonable. So this is what we've got with deduction guides. We say, if you call a constructor that looks kind of like this, uh, the pair constructor, then arrow, we want you to choose to create a struct that has these template parameters. All right. So C++ still doesn't have function traits, which I really like because of the stuff that I like to play with. Boost does. But C++ 17's deduction guides now work with standard functions. So we'll, we can do this. This is neat. You don't have to specify the type of your function now. Deduction guides, yay. Now we've got the situation where f contains all the information that we want. It has the return type and all the parameter types and the arity and, and such hidden in its signature. How can we abuse this? This is how we can abuse it. Uh, so we have our function traits class that is defined on line 18, or struct, and it derives from the function traits <laughs> impl, and it's using the decal type of the deduced standard function for the function that was passed in. So we deduce it, then we pass this up to our function traits impl, which is a partial specialization on a standard function, and we extract the signature out of it, and then we unwrap that in our function traits impl. So this is kind of, it's got two levels of inheritance here. Function traits is going to inherit from function traits impl standard function, and then it's going to inherit again from function traits impl with the actual signature we want. And so now, we can take advantage of the fact that standard function has type deduction for us and extract out the ARD or whatever we want for the types. Are we having fun? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, was, I see somewhat confused and somewhat amused looks. So deduction guides in general must be in the form of type with the arguments that were passed to it to the concrete template type. So for example, like we had in our pair. But getting a little bit more real world, we have our, I'm building a real function signature set of type traits for myself. And this is the first four of the, uh, uh, 26 that are required, I believe, is the correct answer. Um, and so for each thing that's passed in, we've got, you know, is it a free function? Is it a free function that's no accept? Because C++17 made no accept part of the type system. So that doubles the number of, of overloads that we needed to have for determining our function traits. And then we've got volatile, volatile, no accept, const, const volatile, no accept, et cetera, et cetera. It keeps going. And then we've got uh, reference and R value reference and regular value overloads for all of them. So after we've made all the deduction guides for all of these member and function pointer types for the 24, what is left over that we might still want to deduce the type of? Anyone? Uh, pointer and member data is true, I have, but I haven't done that yet. Yes? Lambdas? Lambdas. Or, in general, anything with a call operator. So, we can do this. As we said, the, function, the uh, deduction guide must have a uh, concrete thing. So, we can recursively call our other deduction guides. And so our function signature for the thing that's left over, the last thing that's left that didn't match anything else, is going to be something that has an operator paren. So we can see on lines 5, 7, and 9 that we are using our previous function signatures 
to deduce the type of the operator paren and then getting those values back out and building our function signature deduction guide. Yes? What about things convertible to function pointers or member function pointers? Things that are convertible to function pointers and what else is convertible to a function pointer besides a object with a static operator paren? Oh, that's right, you can write conversion operators to function pointers. I totally forgot about that. Yeah, but if you did that, it would work. It would have been captured by one of the previous deduction guides. If you don't, then it'll get captured by this deduction guide. We'll work the same way. But yeah, you're right. So, well, regardless. The point of this is that you can recursively call our deduction guides back. I think that's handy. So then we've got if constant expr. It's a compile time block. You put in a constant expression. If true, the first block is compiled, else the second block is compiled. So we can do things like this. Like what is the remainder of a floating point number divided by a floating point number? And C and C++, that's a compile time error. And I mean, you could log logically argue that, that, that the answer should just be zero, I think, because if you've divided a floating point number and a floating point number, there is no remainder. Or you could perhaps implement this to be like, what is the floating point error? Maybe could be the remainder or something, but anyhow. So we can use if const expert to, to create code like this, and otherwise it uses the uh, modulus operator and returns the remainder. Right. So it's important to point out that the if const expert is not short circuit. So if the, if you try to do something inside the block that would cause a compile time error because of the, the first thing passed, so we've got is same v, make signed t, uh, you cannot make a floating point number signed, so it would get us a compile time error because the second half of the constant expression block would fail to compile. Does that make sense? So you just have to do nested if const expert blocks. So I thought I would uh, play around and see how compile times differed for const expr, uh, if const expr and sfine. So we've got this if const expr. And this is the sfine version, or at least a sfine version of it, which I don't like. I don't like sfine. Put it in the title. And so I just thought I would compare, compile the two of them, and see which one gave me better compile time results. And I'm taking advantage of our for each alum to create a tuple of all of the built-in types that I'm, well, I missed a couple, like W, car, T, and stuff like that. And use our nested for each alum to do a multiplication of all these different tuple, uh, all the different types versus each other. So I'm instantiating, it's like 24 times 24 different calls to remainder. So anyone want to hazard a guess as to which one worked out better if const expr the Sfine version compile? Odin wants to guess. If const expr is going to be faster, faster says Odin. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it is. A tiny, tiny bit faster. Itty bitty bitty. A quality of implementation. Possibly it was GCC, I don't know. I did not try this particular test with Clang. Uh, because I've been mostly building nightly GCCs lately playing with this stuff. So this leads us to the question of lambdas with multiple signatures, which if constexpr will allow. So if we wanted to do this, we want a callback that could take zero parameters or one that's un8, one that's un16. Hypothetical, kind of. So what would we put in our, in our lambda parameter list? Anyone? Yeah, auto dot dot dot. Why not? Auto dot dot dot. So then we need to make sure that we're only being invoked with zero or one parameters. We can do that with static assert. And then we can use if const expr and say if zero parameters, then we're just going to return the value back zero. Like the return value is kind of meaningless here. And then on line six, if we've got exactly one parameter, then we handle the one parameter cases. So in there, we want to do another static assert that says 
is our type either UN16 or UN8. Now, does anyone, um, this, this should look a little odd. Lines eight and nine should. Not just the weirdness that I'm doing, but the actual call to is same V. Because I'm pretty sure is same V takes exactly two parameters. But I'm doing a variadic expansion in it. But I've already proven to myself that there's going to be at most one thing expanded. So that's cool. Exactly one thing, yes, exactly one thing expanded in this, in this particular branch. So then I do uh, if const expur, um, so, so I'm, I'm going into the uint 8t branch, and I now have another problem. I've got a variadic list of parameters, so I've got p times 2, this can't compile because it's unexpanded. So I can just use a C++ 17. <laughs> That's cool. It's just going to fold it to just the value of p. Or I can use my, one of my favorite tricks, forward it as a tuple and then get the zeroth element back out of it. And then un16t is the only option that's left. And there we go. Perfectly clear way to handle zero or one parameters of two types. <laughs> Maybe we can do it better. So C++ 17 adds variadic using, and variadic using is exactly what it says. It allows you to use using in a variadic context. So we're doing an expansion of it. And what we have here? It, it actually allows you to use uh, like a comma-separated list of things you are using. Oh, you can do a comma-separated list of things yeah, you're using? Like you could write using base, pool, comma, base, bar, Oh, okay, so you could do more than one thing, not just... Yeah, and that was, that was the extension, and, and that's why this works, because uh, like variadic expansion expands into a comma-separated list of things. I see. So the reason it works under the hood is that it's doing a variadic expansion of comma-separated things, and the comma-separated things is really what was added in C++17. Is that right? Okay. So we have our merged that is deriving from the set of things passed in, and then our constructor is moving them all into their base class positions, and we're using all the operator parens. And this lets us, this is perhaps a better way to create our lambda that can have multiple different signatures, zero or one parameter of two different types. So this is handy for visitors, and we'll get to that in a second. But also, uh, I just want to point out, I didn't specify the no except specification for our constructor, and I probably should have. So notice I'm not using conjunction here. <laughs> I'm using a variadic fold, or a fold expression from C++17. Oh, moving faster than I expected to. So C++17 allows you to return multiple values, uh, essentially. I mean, not like we couldn't always do this, but I think people are going to be using it more. So we've got this code um, as an idea for returning multiple values from a function. And what is the problem here? Get is ugly. Get is ugly. Uh, well, we won't be using goal, get on the other end. We'll be using a, yeah, 17, yeah. Is it LVO friendly? Oh, LVO. Uh, sorry, LVO, yes. Is it return value optimization friendly? Um, yeah, it's being copied in. There's no way around it. It must be copying them in. So we're making copies of S1 and S2 into our tuple and then removing that. So, or re returning that. So our tuple that's being returned, yeah, that's our VO family, but it's containing copies of the strings in the first place. So what might we do instead? We might move the strings. This is when I say, hey, who was in the last training I did and would say what's not ideal about this code? <laughs> what's that? No, it does not return tuple of references uh, because the deduction for the tuple here is going to decay like I was showing in the other thing. So it's, it's going to return a tuple of values. It's still not constructing 
It's still not constructing the strings in place on the tuple. So if we recall, and, and this came up in our keynote on Tuesday, that the moved from thing still must be destructed. So we have these leftover shells, if you will, S1 and S2, that the data has been moved from them. But if they're small string optimization, that really gained us nothing at all. It's, it's copying the size of a couple of pointers, whatever the maximum size is for a small string optimization. I think it's 16 characters on most things that I've played with. So we still don't have an optimal. This is, is pretty much the only way to optimally take advantage of returning multiple values in C++17. Um, anyone all right? Everyone all right with this? All right. So I think this is going to be difficult, and it's going to be an issue for our code. Uh, I, I think people are. I think people are going to accidentally pessimize their return statements. Like everyone's going to have learned their lessons about how RVO, RVO works, and then they'll forget it once they start trying to return multiple values. It's my opinion. So we're going to try to avoid polymorphism. We're trying to do polymorphism without dynamic allocation. C17 adds standard variant. Are we familiar with? what standard variant is. Yes. It can be at most one of these types of things. So our V can be an int, a double, or a string. And if we assign it now, our value V is equal to uh, the string hello world. And it uh, is basically a union of these types, so it never has to do dynamic allocation to construct a value. So if we know something that has got a, a fixed size, and we do this, there's no, no allocations have, been happen, have happened. We initialized it with a 3.2, and then we changed that out, swapped it out with our statically sized thing, and the variant's going to handle all of the construction, destruction, whatever it needs to do. And taking advantage of our merged lambda from before, we can now do a visit and we can have our variant of these different things and pass in our merged lambda and it'll call the appropriate sub lambda, if you will, in our visit based on the uh, type that it currently was. So in this particular example, line seven would actually get executed. Okay. But our visitor can be a generic lambda. So we can do this. So if all of the types in here that we have support the O stream stream operator, then we can uh, insertion operator, then we can we can do this and just do C out on whatever happens to be there. So if we take this to the next stage, we can have a set of types, and our variant can be one of these set of types. And then we can now give ourselves a free function that takes our variant and calls the appropriate met method member of the thing that happens to be contained in the variant. Is that all right? Any questions? No questions. All right. So then we can take advantage of this, create our array of variant things, and initialize it with a set of things, accumulate over them, calling our free function that we just defined. It would be kind of nice at this point to have our uh, uniform call syntax, and then return the result. So the question is, does this actually work, basically? So I'm going to switch over to the Compiler Explorer. Everyone familiar with what the Compiler Explorer is? This is, I'm getting no's. OK, Compiler Explorer is a tool. It's at gcc.godbolt.org. 
I am running my own custom version of it that gives the output from the builds and such when you run it that I've got running on my local system. But gcc.godbolt.org, you type in code, it gives you the uh, disassembly output on the right side, but you can do all kinds of different things. There's a million different compilers available, and it gives you whatever warnings were generated if you ask it to. So this is our complete example. Is this legible for everyone? So we can see in this example that we are using polymorphism. We've got our git val here that is virtual, and we've got our derived type that has our override of our, and the returns two, returns four. We're initializing our array with these two values, and we get, we can see the compiler perfectly optimizes it, and it just simply returns six. Ben, yes? There's no reason for these structures to be related, though, is there? There is no reason for the structures to be related. No, well, the question is, is there a reason for the structures to be related? The answer is, I would say it depends. In this particular case, they, there's no reason for them to be related. But if you were taking something that you had a reason for it to be a class hierarchy and wanted to say, well, but I've got polymorphism and dynamic allocations all over the place and I want to avoid that, like what could we possibly just make out of this? So we are, we're doing that and the compiler is able to uh, perfectly optimize it. And this is again, I uh, know this is Clang at the moment actually. I'm not using GCC here. It was a nightly build from, I don't know, a while ago. So I'm doing this with two elements. And what happens if I add a third? I thought the number of the inlining shall be three, but I seem to be getting two for this particular example. The yeah, the compiler has to devirtualize it also. So if I take this, and I add a third object, um, then we can see all of the ugliness where it's having to do V tables, but it's still not that bad. It's a pretty small program on the compiled side. There's a few things that can help us. If we give the compiler some hints so it knows further what it can devirtualize, then that goes away. Or as Ben suggested, there's really no reason for them to be related at all. And now at this point, we can do whatever we want to. And, oh no, I went too far. How far can we take it? Yeah, there we go. So four, it's able to inline it and fold it down. Anyone want to take a guess as to how GCC does with these examples? Worse. <laughs> yeah, even it's it, it seems to to not be able to get around these potential calls to bad variant access and that kind of thing, which should be irrelevant because it knows it's passing it to an auto lambda it can take any type. So that's where we are with that. Do we have any comments before I move on? Yeah, Ben. Does it change if I make the array const? That's an interesting question and a question I probably should have asked. No. Not here. Although I have seen better luck with GCC or with Clang. Let's see if we can push it one step further. No, const doesn't matter. Okay, so there we are. And I think I have absolutely flown through my presentation. Let's see what we've got left. And the cases where the code is not inline and folded, we've essentially turned every function call into a virtual function call. 
that's the point here. Uh, but it's an interesting exercise, I think, because essentially for any function call into our, uh, our well, any call into our git val here and this visit function, it's going to have to say, is it type 1, is it type 2, is it type 3, is it type 4? It's effectively making every single call into a virtual table, but probably worse. But it's possible on extremely constrained uh, platforms that it might be an acceptable trade-off if you want to avoid dynamic allocation. Then you have a fixed size array or some sort of fixed buffer that you push things into at a runtime determine they are, what they are. So that is, I really did move fast. Is there anything anyone like to go back on? Any other questions? Uh, yes, so the, Charlie. The, the example right there where you're essentially virtualizing because you've got a variant of the table that we're entirely generating all those cases. Yes. You just made the comment that uh, is that is that more runtime expensive than an actual virtual table or not? Uh, I would hazard that it is more expensive than an actual virtual call because the compilers have been optimized to know how to do virtual calls efficiently. And how efficient is the variant type, runtime type lookup is a different question. But I am, am not sure. Yes, Chandler. General indirect. A virtual function call looks like a function call through a function pointer for most parts of most compilers. Okay. There, there are a few places in LLVM and in PHP and in XLC that do type based virtual call optimization, but it's relatively rare. So Chandler's comment was that compilers are optimized to do things through indirection, and for the most part, a, a, a virtual function looks like indirect function call. And variant is not one of these things that would be optimized for necessarily. Well, I, th there shouldn't be any problem designing variants so that its indirect calls are just as optimizable as the indirect call in a virtual function call. Okay. Um, if you can get it to a single indirection, I have seen variant implementations which have double indirection. That's always going to be more expensive. Okay, so yeah, it. But, but you can make a variant implementation where, where you basically have a table of. Okay, so if the variant is designed well and it's a single indirection, then it should be approximately the same as a virtual function call. I, I think it's the most obvious implementation of the variant, so it should be like that in every implementation. That carries both ways. Does that answer your question, Charlie? Yes. Okay. Ben. So on the code expressions, yes. the unary code expressions and the binary code expressions. Yes. Yes. As, as the unary expression. Right? Yes. But there's also a way to, Victoria was showing me last night at up by Alchem, I can't remember the code, but you can take a binary function and also you can wrap it and use comma operator similarly so you can inject your own binary function into a fold expression. So the comment was you can inject your own binary expression into a fold expression by, I guess, overloading the comma operator. And I have played with that, although I don't personally like overloading the comma operator, so I've done it with overloading the left shift operator, for example, or something else that I didn't think was going to be in use right there. I just thought it seemed a little bit more readable personally. Did you say, uh, uh, Odin, yes? Uh, on our deduction guides, how crazy can we go? The thing, the main constraint you have to remember is that the thing on the right must deduce to a concrete type. Yeah. It must be a type here. But outside of that, I mean, if we're ever allowed to use um, lambdas in this kind of context, you could do some really nutty stuff. We're not currently allowed to use them in this context. But you could do pretty much whatever. You can do any function call 
well, hypothetically, if you were to parse JSON at <laughs> compile time <laughs> and have some constant expression, you could put the result of that here. Okay. Cool. Yes. Yes. Okay. Just, uh, just you know, crazy idea. Yeah, no one would ever do that. No one would ever do that. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, go ahead. Is it possible to anonymize duplicated uh, function trace for no except uh, and the normal except function if we pass the uh, uh, whole template as an end? Uh, so is it possible to eliminate the no except? For example, uh, you have I I think you still have to make this deduction here to know to, to match it in the first place. You have to do the no except because that's essentially what I'm doing is I'm then passing true or false depending on whether or not it's no except down to the uh, down to the actual implementation which I don't have on this slide. I make that a static const bool in the function signature uh, temp, uh, class template. So there's no way to deduce, like, like putting no except uh, parentheses and like a variable name, uh, a non type <coughs> template type, a uh, non type template argument there to let it be deduced? You're saying, is there a way to make a variable? But that's basically the same question, right? Like, is there possible to make no except into? somehow variable template. So template bool something, no except. Not that I, I'm, I'm pretty sure not. Um, but I could be corrected by someone who knows, in general, the standard and, and function template deduction, or matching better than I do. But I, I don't think so. Anything else? Anyone else want a t-shirt? Um, extra low, medium or extra large? Medium. Thank you. You're welcome. And who else raised their hand? XL, XL all the way in the back. XXL. I don't have XXL. Sorry. XL. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and XL. All right, I've got two left, both XLs. Oh, close. And another XL? Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, you raised your hand first. I've got another XL. Uh, Charlie can find me later. All right, thank you, everyone. Sorry I ran short. <laughs>